The early 20th century was a time of change in society, in war, culture, and more. Lots of change. One of the biggest differences from this time and the century prior was the advent of personal transportation. And as this technology grew cheaper, it reached both the mass consumer market and the battlefield. This was the car. Few inventions can claim to have such resounding impact on our way of life. And it's very common for one name to pop up when talking about the early days of the car, Henry Ford. <laughs> he wasn't the inventor of the car, no, not by a long shot. But it was the business statement behind his most successful company that really cements him in history. So Jimmy, buckle up, cause we're talking about the life of Henry Ford. He was born in a small township near Detroit in 1863. He wasn't the richest of kids, nor the poorest. But in his youth, he found some interest in taking apart stuff and putting it back together. As he grew older, he worked on Westinghouse steam engines and engineering elsewhere. But he had other interests. Using the skills he had learned over years, he developed a simple autonomous vehicle the Ford Quadricycle in 1896. Now, Carl Benz had already developed the world's first gas-powered car in 1886, so the Quadricycle wasn't breaking any records. It had bike tires, a somewhat limited four-horsepower engine, and really just was a test of sorts. It never reached mass production, nor did it seem like it was intended to. But a few years later, this would start to become something more. In 1899, Ford creates the Detroit Automobile Company. Its primary purpose was building delivery trucks and showing that vehicles could be a cheap alternative to horse-drawn carriages. Not many trucks were made and the business was in trouble. Just two years later, the company was gone. But not forever. It rose from the ashes just a few months later with Ford's next try at an automobile business. The Henry Ford Company. And then Ford left that in another few months. Lots of trial and error, but those who stayed kept the company running and it became Cadillac. Yes, that Cadillac. Well, Ford took a break and was invested in building various race cars. He would get public recognition for his engineering skills and it must have given him the confidence to try his hand, once again, at the car making game. He gained some valuable investors along with some prominent engineers to assist him in this next endeavor. Two of those engineers were Horace and John Dodge. Yeah, we'll talk about those guys later, so keep them in mind. So, it was in 1903 in Dearborn, Michigan that Henry Ford started the Ford Motor Company. Yes, it's that Ford Motor Company. What a stupid question, Jimmy. The intent by Ford was to develop a cheap car for the everyman. Cars in this era were commonly priced close to $4,000, or somewhere close to $100,000 today. So if you saw some dude riding along in a horse's carriage, that dude was pretty well off. It was transportation exclusively for the wealthy. Now with any new technology, it's gonna be really expensive at first, but over time those costs drop. And Ford knew that if he could get in on this phenomenon in its early days, he could have a huge success on his hands. So we have Ford's, the company's, first car, the Model A. It cost $800, about $22,000 today. Was it cheap? I mean, not really, but it was definitely cheaper. A good start, and a lot of people saw the appeal, but competition in even this market was intense. While most cars were quite pricey, as early as 1901, companies like Oldsmobile were putting out $650 cars. They weren't alone either. Companies like the long since defunct Success put out insanely cheap $250 cars, but these only had two horsepower. The Model A had eight. In something like the success, hitting 20 miles per hour was basically impossible. Needless to say, this brand wasn't a success. <laughs> uh, so the Model A did have a market. It was seen as a more premium take on these new inexpensive car brands. But Ford wasn't content. The goal was to increase power output while lowering cost. Well, the long-term goal. The Model A's successor, the aptly named Model B, was priced at a steep $2,000, more than double that of the Model A. To be fair, it was 24 horsepower and was quite fancy, but it was really more of an ideal that future models could strive for while decreasing price. So Ford went back to some cheaper cars, many different models that were improving on the predecessor. After a few years, it seemed Ford had figured it out. This was the car that cements both Henry and his company in the history books, the Model T. Now, there is a lot of inaccuracies that pop up in many circles about the Model T. Obviously, it wasn't the first car, and it also wasn't the first cheap car. 
but it was the first car to be so massively successful. Now, did Ford invent the assembly line? No. Was he the first to implement it in car manufacturing? Also no. That was Oldsmobile. But what he did was introduce a basic platform for all other cars to strive for. A 20 horsepower engine in a car for only $850. In 1909, this was quite impressive. So what else did the Model T do that differed it from the past, sometimes cheaper vehicles? Well, a lot of it was in the production. Yes, it used an assembly line where each worker has one specific job, but it also completely relied on interchangeable parts. Servicing a car was insanely easy when each part could just be repurchased. It was big enough to drive the whole family, a great contrast over smaller vehicles. But it was also marketing. Ford became a name that represented both quality and affordability. In this early age of consumerism, Ford appeared to be a name you could trust. Now, other car makers took note, most notably General Motors. Yes, they were around even in this time, and like today, they also consisted of several brands. Oldsmobile, with all their success, had become part of GM. Same with Cadillac. General Motors seemed set on becoming the monopoly of the car world. With this in mind, GM approaches Ford with a proposition. Sell Ford to us. Name your price. He names his price. They think it's too much. They decline. That was a pretty stupid mistake by GM. As the Model T continues its success story, Ford was all the while making tweaks to better improve the assembly line. These improvements significantly sped up the car making process, which allowed more cars to be made, and prices dropped as a result. Workers were paid quite well for the time and had pretty good working conditions. Those very workers made enough money to buy a Model T. So as the everyman gains personal transportation, America's culture changes. A lot. So much that I want to cover it in another video. At least if you guys care. Tell me in the comments. But Ford was dealing with some legal trouble at this point. This was, after all, still the early days of the car. And with that, some wise guy and his company, Alum, claimed to own the rights to the patent of the car itself. According to them, anybody building a car has to pay royalties for infringing on their patent. It's stupid, yes, but most companies just went along with it. Ford, however, said no. It was the principle of it. After all, it seems humorous that anybody could claim to own the car. The designs and advancements needed for it took many people from many different countries many years. Alum also made it harder for small car manufacturers to pop up. It really wasn't good for anybody, except for Alum. Well, Alum sues him. And guess what? They lose. The logical decision wins this time, and their stranglehold on the patent for the car is deemed illegal. Hooray! So now, Ford was free from legal repercussions, which shouldn't have existed in the first place. But remember those Dodge brothers? Well, they hadn't been receiving the full payment agreed on for their work. At the same time, they had not received the public recognition for their contributions to Ford's success. So, they leave. I mean, now it's easier for anybody to start a car business, so they start, that's right, Dodge. But something inside Henry changes at this point. He knows the Dodge brothers still hold stock in his company, along with many other investors. He is far wealthier now than when he started the Ford Motor Company, and he saw all the success as his own. He doesn't like the fact that others own part of his company. So he has a bit of a scheme in mind. He proclaims that he is leaving Ford. Done with it. His son will take over. Edsel. A guy that was a complete unknown at the time. Investors panic. They sell their stocks and the price drops. Once a vast majority of the stocks are sold, Henry buys it all up. Many of the investors, including the Dodge brothers, lost a significant amount of their money. And Henry, he's still in charge. Giving Edsel the title of president is meaningless, since at the end of the day, Henry still decides everything. It seems around this point it's probably important to mention Ford's more antagonistic behaviors. Within his business, he had total control. Alternative ideas from his own were instantly dismissed. He had built the largest car manufacturer in the world, and in his eyes, only he could have done that. As for the relationship between him and Edsel, his son, well, it was complicated, very complicated. Edsel would ask Ford about implementing new technological advancements into cars, but Henry always dismissed it. This would end up being a bad idea. The Model T was still Ford's main production car. As 1927 arrives, the Model T had been in production for almost 20 years. 20 years in a time where car technology was constantly making huge leaps forward. Obviously better tech that wasn't implemented into Model T's because Henry's always right. 
Well, it caught up to him. GM and relative newcomer Chrysler were creating better cars with new interesting designs for the trendy 1920s folk. The Model T was antiquated, and it wasn't long before GM takes position as the top manufacturer in the US. Even still, Henry was steadfast in his ways. He didn't see cars as art, more from a practical engineering standpoint. In the era of the Roaring Twenties, people wanted more than the bare minimum. They wanted style, flair, all stuff that Ford lacked. Now Edsel, on the other hand, understood the value of cars as art. His fascination was with how cars looked, the stylish design. Henry didn't like this outlook, and seemed to grow farther from his son. Instead, Ford took interest in a new figure, his security department head, Harry Bennett. A strong man that got into fights, that was his credibility for the job. Ford found him and took him under his wing. Well, this was all well and good, but sales numbers for the Model T were telling. It needed to be discontinued and replaced. And in another complicated moment of their relationship, he allowed Edsel to take part in the design process, while Henry would manage the engineering. The product of this was the Model A. No, not that Model A, a new one. It was a shift in Ford's policy, as it was produced in four different colors as opposed to the Model T's one option. At first it seemed successful, a true successor to the Model T, but then the Great Depression hit. Obviously, in this era of unemployment and starvation, cars sold poorly, but Henry didn't see it that way. He blamed Edsel. He believed the Model T shouldn't have been replaced and Edsel's input just hurt the business. Yeah, it was a stupid notion. But Ford had bigger issues at the time than his complicated relationship with his son, with the Great Depression saw a spike in union interest. And Ford, oh, he despised the unions. But at the same time, unemployment was a given with the worsened economy, and those unemployed workers were quite unhappy. So on March 7th, 1932, workers marched near Ford's plant. It was going all right until police intervention caused some tear gas, some shots fired, what have you. But in this chaos, Ford's security head decides to go towards the crowd and begin shooting. At the end of all this, both officers and civilians are injured, and a few civilians are killed. Now, the legal precedent dictates that Henry Bennett should probably be charged with a crime, but nah. It's possibly one of the first major stains on Ford's public image. He started out identified as the hero of the masses, and now his security force is killing them. Not a good look. But we have cars to discuss. Ford Motor Company was still hindered by Henry Ford's interference. The competition was moving quick. Chrysler had begun looking into aerodynamics to improve performance and style. See the Chrysler Airflow. It really looks to be one of the first modern cars, at least compared to the horseless carriages preceding it. It was something special in an era where Ford was making this. So Ford's kind of doing all around bad. Antiquated cars and bad press. But it gets worse. Those unions are still rising, and Ford is still against them. GM and Chrysler give in to the unions, but Ford holds still. This is until a fateful day on May 26th, 1937. United Auto Workers were planning on handing out leaflets, showing their intent to receive a raise. While preparing, journalists were there with photographers. While they were attempting to take the picture, Ford's security team came out and began beating the workers, violently, with serious injuries. Well, those pictures were took, and the press went to town. Ford's public image was destroyed. He was really no longer in any capacity seen as the hero of the masses. And Ford still doesn't want to sign with the unions. That is until his wife, Clara, tells him she wants a divorce if he doesn't give in. And this works. So I guess all is well now, right? Well, you see, the war had to ruin it all. That's right, World War II. Ford identifies as a pacifist. He wants no part in this war. Also, he doesn't like Jewish people, and some people think he might have some pro-German sentiments during this time, but that's, that's a whole other thing. Edsel disagrees with his father's position and takes a stand. He agrees to help the US in their intent to ship vehicles. Sure, Henry is upset, but it really didn't matter by this point. See, once Pearl Harbor happened, all car manufacturers worked for the military. No more cars were made, at least for consumers. This wasn't a good time for Henry Ford. Making matters worse, Edsel dies of cancer in 1943. Even though they had a weird relationship and it seemed like Bennett would take over, I think Henry really did just expect Edsel to inherit the company. So after this, Henry Ford becomes the president once more. But in his old age and questionable past decisions, the Ford Motor Company doesn't like this much. Well, at least after he starts to lose the company hundreds of millions of dollars a month. So they find the closest thing to Edsel, Edsel's son, Henry Ford II, currently in the military. 
They bring him back from the war, and he's put in charge. Of course, Harry Bennett doesn't like this, and it seems he wants the sort of coup against Ford's grandson. And Harry Bennett had his support in the factory. His supporters walked around with weapons because, I don't know, it's just weird. But when Henry Ford II gets the chance, he fires him and all those weapon-wielding workers. So it's pretty obvious here, the story of Henry Ford is coming to a close. Out of his company, he retired, and he dies April 7th, 1947. He's mourned by many after his death, and the nation feels they lost a larger-than-life figure. Sure, he had some bad times with the public, yeah, but that pales in comparison with the legacy of the Model T, Ford Motor Company and its signature product. The impact of bringing the car to the masses. It brought change to infrastructure, daily life, leisure, work, everything, really. So much that I can't cover it all here. Again, tell me if you want a video about it. In a lot of ways, Ford's cars weren't the best, they weren't the cheapest, and they weren't the most interesting. But that didn't matter. The Model T existed in a perfect moment in history, and because of that, it changed the world. This is Tyler of Knowledge Hub.